Welcome to the Publishing Life podcast. And in today's very special episode, we have an interview with one of my favorite people in the world. If you've been watching our YouTube videos, you're a member of AA. You know who this guy is. You probably love him just as much. He's one of the funniest people in the world as well. Ollie, what's up? Not much, mate. Thanks for having me. It's a nice overcast Wednesday evening in England. You know, can't complain much. All right. So if you know how these interviews go, people love hearing these stories of successful publishers. And, you know, we know each other very well. I know a lot of your story, but I don't know the depths of it. I don't know the beginning of it. I don't know what it was really like when it was going on. All I saw was from the outside and the things you would tell me, but I want you to really spill the truth of what your entire journey was like. Can we do that? Where do you want me to start, mate? I always want to hear life before finding the world, the world of online business. Okay. Uh, What's so the kind of, I'm assuming you had a job. Well, I'm saying that as if I don't know, I know you had a job. I have a good idea of what it was as well, but I want to hear you explain it. Uh, and uh, what was that like? And how did you get into that job in the first place? And why did you get into that job in the first place? Oh boy. Uh, okay. So this is the part where we do the uh, sad music in the background. Yeah. The montage of me crying. Uh, what so, year are we in? What's, what's the location in the world? Circle back to 2012. Mm-hmm, 2012. Uh, graduated university in England. I got an economics degree, which was moderately useful. It's actually more useful in publishing than it was in anything else I ever did. That's um, good. I got a job because I needed money. God, think, think about that. Needing to eat. <laughs> It's one of those terrible things. I applied to, I think, about 70 or 80 jobs. Whoa. Because, um, you know, this was off the back of the last sort of recession. So the job market wasn't exactly hot back then. Mm-hmm. Applied to like 80 jobs, got interviewed for one. Fortunately, somehow like blagged my way through the interview. Got a job in the fast and exciting world of FMCG consumer research, <laughs> which to be fair, every young boy growing up wants to do that. Mm-hmm. I know I like, did. it's pretty much like astronaut NBA player FMCG consumer research yeah and you you, you got one of them congrats on that <laughs> what I'll translate that for everyone listening I stared at Excel um, eight hours a day five days a week and had to explain to confectionery companies why they sold less chocolate bars in the summer than in the winter that's the that's that's the peak of the human experience that's the dream <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what, what does FMCG stand for? Fast moving consumer goods. Fast moving consumer goods. Okay. And I bet and, the pay was amazing. Oh, I was, oh, I was making like 35 grand a year US. Through the roof. <laughs> Through the roof, see? So like Maybe. barely 20,000 pounds a month. Sorry, yeah, a year. A year. 23,000 pounds a year, which was like a pretty decent salary back then. Not like yeah. amazing, but that's pretty decent for a so, uh, university yeah. in England. You know, we were obviously joking about how little that is, but coming out of college, I mean, that's, you know, our barometers kind of change now as to what's a good income. That's, I'm not saying it's good. It's fine. Average fine. income for, for a new graduate. Yeah, pretty much. Um, the best part about that job though, was I had no work. I did I, about an yeah. hour or two of work a week. <laughs> oh, and I managed, to, <laughs> I managed to keep this up for 18 months um what happened after 18 months oh no after about three months i was like this is hell what am i doing but i didn't know what to do so i just mm-hmm. kept doing it because you know that addictive drug of a monthly paycheck was was pretty addictive mm-hmm. and you know i'd lived in england my whole life and i was like i've got to get out i've got to get out so eventually i booked a one-way ticket to china and like just went off with a backpack Wait, did you have some money saved up for Whoa. that i had some money saved up like I was living with my parents at the time. I, you know, the whole idea of just like going out every Friday night and blowing your paycheck on crappy was, alcohol is mm-hmm. kind of old. Yeah. You've done it enough times. Done it enough times. And so literally all I did for like the six months before that was go to work, go to the gym, go home, do nothing else. Yeah. So uh, quick question, kind of similar to what we did. We kind of out of nowhere traveled to Thailand, just dropped everything and just kind of want to see what that life was like. What made you go to China of all places? And then did you have any, what are you going to do for money? What were you, what was going through your head when you left for China? I was going to 
leave for as long as possible. So I just wasn't going to spend any money. So I hustled my way through Asia. That was like 15 months it took to blow. I had like 10 grand saved pounds. So what is that? Like 13, 14,000 US? Oh, wow. yeah. That lasts, I would, I see, that lasts a long time in Asia. I was living super cheap, staying in hostels, like working odd jobs to get by. Like it was a blast. Like it, in terms of pure unadulterated happiness, definitely the happiest time of my life. Oh, I, I, I have the same experiences. The first time you go out and you explore the world in this way, no matter what you try to do again, nothing can ever match that first taste of complete freedom to do whatever the fuck, whatever you want, whenever. Uh, it's it just, so you know, much fun. When you make uh, a decision, the only, uh, you know, thing you're thinking about is what do I want to do the most right now? Okay, that's the yeah. thing I'm going to do. Yeah, I, I agree that, you know, because it was your first go around, there was something special about that. But just in general, going out and traveling and just doing whatever the hell you want gets you so much more ex life experience and happiness out of life than just like um, trying to make as much money as possible and things like that. Like that's what that, that's, that's why not always... actually what what like makes you experience and feel life. Mm -hmm. Things like going to China and then 12 months just living that life that's what really uh it, it's hard to put into words even that's why i always suggest if you had the opportunity to go travel i know oh, I, I i i identify as a person likes to travel a lot of people don't even if you don't try it i think you're you won't regret it even if you you miss home and whatnot you're not gonna regret it and all yeah, you like need is five is... grand all you need is five grand and then you have six months to do oh yeah like it's funny as well. Like I would meet people and they'd be like, oh, you know, I'm traveling for four weeks or six weeks and I'm going home. And I was like, uh, yeah, I don't know when I'm going home. And they're like, what? What do you mean you don't know when? I was like, I don't know. What are you talking about, mate? How's that possible? How's that possible? It's funny. <laughs> like most people you meet are British. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Brits and Americans, we, we get around. Mm -hmm. But, so the... Go ahead. you know, it's it's definitely like an eye-opening experience. You see so many things, you leave your comfort zone. You also like, I think a really underrated part of traveling, maybe you guys didn't get this as much because you were always together, mm -hmm. but just spending time by yourself is so valuable because you actually understand like more about yourself as a person. And especially now where like, we're in this world where, you know, you can spend 24 hours a day connected to something, mm -hmm. you know, you're on your phone or you're on, facebook talking to people then you're then you're at work you actually don't get any time by yourself but when you travel for like a long time you get so much time by yourself and you understand a lot about who you are as a person yeah i'll be honest i i haven't experienced that because i've always been a christian and i've done anything to not have to be be alone <laughs> <laughs> nah it's it's super interesting actually you will you will learn so much just about like who you are and also like really what what is important to you and even after the 15 months were done, I was like, I didn't want to go home. The only reason I went home is because I had no money. Yeah. So, so then when, when, you, when, when you were, can I ask a question, Rasmus? Yeah. When you were traveling, backpacking around China, did you go to any other countries or just China in that period? Oh, no, I was in China for like six weeks and I went to, I went to North Korea for a week. That was mental. Mm. Right. We talked about that for a long time, but let's not. <laughs> we did a North Korea episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll yeah, have we'll another North that. Korea episode. Um, uh, uh, I went to, let me think, Hong Kong, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, okay. Malaysia, so Singapore, Philippines. All Asia theme. Yeah. Okay. Went during, during that 15 month or 18 month period that you mentioned, did you ever think about like making money online and just the reality of it or if it was even possible or how to supplement your income or how to continue doing this? No, That's I actually had tried before. I'll tell you my first online business, if you want to know. I actually Please. don't know if you guys know this. Yeah, I don't know. No, I want to hear this. So, but real quick, like the crazy thing is most people don't even know this world exists. Like to us, it's our everything. It's literally our universe. The only thing we know. Others don't even know that it exists. Yeah. Uh, not even that it's possible or how real it is, that it even exists. That, so that's just crazy. But anyway. Yeah. To add to that, actually, I was I went to the 10x conference a couple of years ago, and I was with uh, one of our friends in Mecca, and we were in a bar, and he was like, "How many people here do you think have heard of Grant Cardone?" 
And I was like, none. None. Our world is so small. Yeah, yeah. It's true. And yeah, I just thought that was funny based on what you said about like people don't know this exists. They absolutely do not. Yeah. No, they absolutely do not. Uh, and it is I'm crazy. Pretty now, sure let's... my mum still thinks like I'm a scammer. <laughs> no, <I'm not> a <laughs> Online, you must be doing something wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You must be selling drugs. I can't understand it. It's not real. Doesn't exactly. Yeah. She knows the internet is for buying things, but she doesn't understand that people have to sell some of those things. <laughs> we'll get uh, we'll get to that stage eventually. Mum, I love you. That, that's funny. So All right, what's, what's that first, first failed business, business venture you had? So back in the day, I used to post a lot on bodybuilding.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, shout out to the MISC. If anyone remembers the MISC, <laughs> there was a guy on there who apparently was making, he claimed he was making $70,000 a month by flipping Twitter accounts. So this would have been in like 2011, 2012. And all you had to do, this is this should have been the first red flag. All you have to do is, it was put in a bunch of quotes into a piece of software and then the software will tweet the quotes out for you automatically with like the relevant hashtags. That'll blow up your account. Then you can sell ads and then eventually you can sell the account. That's genius. So I had, I had a... One Direction fan account because that apparently that was a big niche. You should do <laughs> banned fan pages. I can't tell if this is true or not. No, this is one hundred percent true. Oh my god! Because he had a Wiz Khalifa fan page that had like a million followers. Ooh. In hindsight, it probably wasn't even his. <laughs> but this is what he claimed, and I this really is like... for two thousand eleven. If you're talking about Wiz Khalifa and One Direction as like the biggest, <laughs> oh yeah, biggest fan pages. The, you know, me being a naive 21 year old, just wanted to get rich quick. I was like, yeah, I'll do it. Mm-hmm. And so I built a couple of Twitter accounts. Uh, they got to like five, 6,000 followers. Then they got banned because I was just automatically tweeting stuff like a hundred times a day. <laughs> shit, shit, shit. <laughs> Bad business model guys. Don't do it. <laughs> that was my first, first failed business. And then I didn't really do anything after that. Like I had a niche site that I tried to build myself like literally writing the code myself. Um, Sounds unrealistic. Yeah, it was. Uh, in four months, I put up one page. Amazing. But yeah, that probably from the, from like that point to actually starting a real online business was about four years. So like yeah. while I was traveling around, I had no idea how to make money. So I became an English teacher. Well, so oh, okay. then you ran out of money, which forced you to yeah. go back to the UK. What happened when you got back to the UK? I left within a month. I was like, I can't take this. This is horrible. Mm. So how'd you have the money? You just did the online English teaching? Yeah. To make money so while you were out traveling? I had like 2,000 pounds left. I was like, I've, I'll just go and get I'd a rather job. be rather be homeless abroad than live here doing whatever the hell is going on here. That's what it was like. That's what it was like. I was like, I have to leave. I cannot take this place. Mm-hmm. So where you did know, you go then? Back to Asia? Yeah, I went back to Taiwan which was a great country. No one's been to Taiwan. Taiwan's great. Everyone yeah. go to Taiwan. Great place. So from well, this time in Taiwan until you first found out about publishing, like how much time is there in that gap? That's so like I want to see if I can year. fast forward without this being. Oh yeah, go for it. It was like 18 months. Oh, okay, okay. I did that for a year, built up some money, started traveling again. And then the money started running low again. So I was like, okay, this is dumb. So how did I you don't... first... Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Everyone has like that moment where they discover that the world of making money online exists, that it's possible there are people doing it. And like, it's this, yeah, Uh, there's this other dimension that I had no idea existed. How did you discover it? I, so I was on Upwork at the time. And I found an article of this, of this guy who's like, how I make six figures a year as a copywriter. I was like, what, what's copywriting? I, I read the article and this guy was like, yeah, basically I just get copywriting jobs on Upwork and I can charge a hundred bucks an hour. I was like, what? <laughs> what, man? A hundred dollars an hour. <laughs> you intensify your British accent. When you're back. <laughs> yeah, when I get surprised, I, I get more British. And, and I don't know what it was, but like, I was like, hang on i don't think this guy's full of it i think he actually is doing this the guy's name was danny margulies big up danny margulies absolute legend mm-hmm. and i bought his course i bought a course it was 497 dollars i didn't really have 
Ooh. And I made it work. And so for like six months, my income went up. And then I was like, hang on a second. I need to divorce my time from my work. Mm-hmm. So I started searching passive, passive income. Passive income, baby. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a baby so, on the so, end too, right? When you searched it. So you are now making your own money doing copywriting freelance yeah. work? Okay. And how much like, were you able to make? How much were you able to make doing that? Just provide context of everything. I'd I'd like to hear how much you were making at every stage. It was about four thousand dollars a month at that point. Oh, okay. so a lot. Which in Asia is huge. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, you are in the top one percent in Asia. Mm-hmm. Oh Thank yeah. You and you were probably working a lot doing that. Is that right? I was working a decent amount, probably like 30, 40 hours a week. Which yeah. you know, I'm, it's not like grind yourself into the ground thing but it was essentially a full-time job yeah yeah so then you went you realized you wanted to not trade time for money yeah you, you searched passive you search passive income Lit- online and then literally passive income on youtube and the baldy guy came up the yes baldy guy. yes the baldy guy it's it's exact same way we were introduced to this world baldy yep. guy the baldy guy it was the baldy guy and the italian guy so that people know who Baldy guy is, I, I don't know if I, I have no. You don't mean that disrespectfully. Yeah, no, yeah, no, we no. love, it's we love inside joke. It's an inside joke. His name is Stephen James, um, and yeah, he talks about how to fucking make money online. And one of the things he talks about is Kindle publishing, as he calls it. I don't really yeah. call it. It's called publishing in general. Uh, but yeah, explain how things played out from there. Yeah, how's your experience publishing your first book, first few books? Oh, I was a genius. I was like, I'm going to make a book about how to make money on Upwork. <laughs> okay. I was like, I know how to do that. So I wrote it myself. It took oh, me about... I, really? You've done this? It took me about three weeks to write because I didn't really know what I was doing. Whacked it up and it actually made some sales. Made about 50 bucks a month. Mm-hmm. Uh, ex- dude, exact same story for myself. The first book I've ever published, I wrote myself instead of three weeks. It took two days to write though. And it was about something that I knew, which was, you know, how to get good grades in college. Really, really, we were getting really good grades in college just by gaming the system because that's how college is. It's a fucking system. It's not real mm-hmm. education. Uh, just my opinion. We won't go down there. Uh, but I published that thing, wrote it myself in a few days, and it was making like 50 bucks a month. And it was, it was just crazy. It was, it's, it's that feeling of, hang on, I'm getting paid for something I did two days ago? What? Mm-hmm. And I'm still getting paid? And, I and then two months ago, and then two Next years month. ago. That book exact, was still making sales like years later. Yeah. The exact book I just mentioned made sales. I don't know if today, but most certainly this week I published yeah. it in 2016. It's now 2021 and it's still making me money. Mind boggling almost. It's such like a, an eye opening moment where you're like, oh, wow, this stuff. Because it, it, it really just confirms that it's real. Because mm-hmm. so many of the, these ideas, you want to believe that it's not real. Because, you know, I didn't have the best financial education growing up. It wasn't particularly bad, but like I didn't read Rich Dad, Poor Dad or any of those books. I didn't really understand how the world worked. And once you see it and it's real, you're like, oh, I can just do this more and make more of the money. This is kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. All under the condition that you actually do it. You actually got to do it. Unfortunately. Yeah, I always say I wish there was a, a a magical third option where you could pay someone else to do it for you. Well, well, you didn't have to pay them. You didn't have to pay them, and they'd do it for you, and it'd just happen. That's what people want. Yeah, too bad. Isn't that called cool. unemployment? <laughs> I think that's another way of saying it. Uh, I think get paid maybe. for doing nothing. Yeah, just get paid for doing nothing. Um, and this is actually how I met my good friend Christian Mickelson because we were in a Facebook group together. And this dude was it was crushing it. He was making like six grand a month. I was like, oh my, oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. This was in the middle of 2017. So we were in the same Facebook group together. And it was just Christian. Just just Christian. It was only Christian in the Facebook group. I didn't was, exist. Was, I didn't exist back then. There was no Rasmus Bukwison. And I'm not kidding. It took me six months to realize there was a twin. <laughs> Because Christian was the only one allowed in the Facebook group. And then one day, I think it was in another Facebook group or something, I see this Rasmus Mickelson character. And I thought it was a troll account because he looked <laughs> just like you. It, and then that moment I was like, 
all oh, right, they're twins. Oh my god! A penny wow. drop for me there. Yeah. I've never professed to be the smartest person, so. Yeah. What was the path like from the first book that you published, like you just explained, to a point where publishing was paying for your entire lifestyle? Um, it probably took like nine months, mm-hmm. but it was a very. Um, it was basically I, I failed like twenty six times in a row. Mm -hmm. and then suddenly everything clicked i had a book that took off and i sort of reverse engineered everything that made that book work and then suddenly it's like it was it was like i switched the game from hard mode to easy mode Mm -hmm. because i thought okay i can just replicate this like Mm -hmm. this isn't even difficult to me anymore Mm-hmm. And what what were the biggest takeaways for you that re- you realized were like the biggest factors that made a book sell and make money? Actually writing to people as opposed to writing for an algorithm. Mm-hmm. Like anyone can put a keyword in a title. Most people can't actually make a book that people want to read. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, you, you put in a keyword, you run some ads to a book and then, okay, it's great. You get some sales, but then the book gets swamped with bad reviews. But if you actually make a good book that people want to read, you get good reviews. It's a and this is, book. yeah. And suddenly you're like, oh, hang on a second. This is what people like. Why don't I just make more of the same of that? And so I did. To anyone listening to this right now that's new to public, I, I just really want people to, under, to understand this. And that is that just creating a book and publishing it is not, is not, all you need or is not what it takes to make money not just because you publish a book do you then deserve to make money or it will just make money just because it has to be done well like you say you have to write a book that people actually want um so i guess my, my point is that many people will publish a book or even two books and uh, or more and it won't perform the way that they want and they'll think that something's wrong when it's not and what you explained you had done things wrong 26 times in a row before you finally figure it out. That also reminds me of a video I watched yesterday, which was every successful person, their uh, path to success looks the exact same. And it's full of fucking failures for a long stretch of time. And if your path doesn't look that way, then that's why, because that you never went through that. Um, Yeah. That's got to fail a bunch. You know, such an important thing to understand. Mm-hmm. See, like it's not linear. Mm-hmm. It's definitely not linear. Like it's. It just bugs me when people publish a, a shitty book and it won't make money, uh, or not much. It's really hard for a book to make no money at all, but it'll make little. And then it's well, this doesn't work. It's whatever, whatever. <sighs> it can't just be any book. It can't just put it up and expect it to sell. Right, so. and, and it really becomes like a habit or a character trait for a person whether or not they endure failures and then continue and try to learn from and get better or they fail once and then they stop. Like an example for me just in the past few years um, is when it comes to a thing I've worked a lot on the last few few years is making webinars. So now I've made like six, I'm working on my seventh one right now. And uh, you know, the first one was horrific. The second one was bad, but it was able to break even. The third one was able to be profitable. The fourth one uh, was, compl- I didn't even run because it was so bad. And then the fifth one made good money. And then from there, it got better. But the first four were more or less complete utter failures. Uh, whilst, and I guess that's just a um, character trait that I have is like, I know this can work. I'm just doing it wrong. I'm just failing. And it's a part of the process. While most people, I'm not sitting here to like to my horn, but just saying most people might try something like that. And then the first one doesn't work. And then, okay, this is not something that works. Yeah, it's, it's that distinction between, you know, understanding your own flaws and what you may have done wrong and learn from the mistakes versus just blaming everyone else. Yeah. It's because yeah. it's very easy just to blame everyone else and be like, okay, this, this is a scam. Yep. It's the but, easy way. Yeah. And it's you know, that's the nature of the business you guys are in. And it's, but it's also like on the flip side, as, as the customer, you've got to sort of realize that 
you've got to put in the work. It's like joining a gym. Like, okay, if you join a gym, that doesn't mean you're going to get swole. It doesn't mean you're going to lose weight. You've actually got to show up and actually do the reps. Such a simple you but can't just perfect analogy. Pick up 10 pounds and rep these out. Still nothing will happen. I guess that's the equivalent of just publishing a bad book. You technically lifted, but you didn't you do ha- it well. You yeah, did it twice. <laughs> like, yeah. You've got to show up every day for like, you know, four times a week for the next three months. Then you'll get results. Yeah. And you actually have to learn what you're doing and how to yeah. do it and then eat properly and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, what you got to do is actually do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, mm-hmm. I always, I always say like this business is actually very simple. It's not easy, but it's very simple. Very simple. No, that's perfect. Yeah, right. It's not easy, but the simplest almost can't imagine something more simple. And um, then I want to follow it up by saying nothing that can change your life in such a way is easy. If, you, if, if you're not going to like, start with something until you find something that's easy, you're going to be searching forever because it doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, no, nothing at all in life is easy. I heard this yesterday um, from a guy named Myron Golden. Um, he was just talking about how, you know, working a job is hard and not easy. Having your own business is hard and not easy. But one is hard on the front end and easy on the back end. While one is e- easier on the front end and just really bad on the back end. So it's yeah. just like choose your hard and uh, yeah, uh, it's just, it's interesting. Can yeah, I, can I you, say something now? Whether you do it at a job on your own business, you got to work hard regardless. So let's yep. yeah, lean to it towards something that's going to give you a much better outcome, which is own your yeah. own business. Uh, uh, Ollie, the first memory I have of you, not the very first one, but one of the, fir- the first distinct one was a picture of you riding an ostrich. Yep. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and you being on the thumbnail of one of Ameka's videos, riding an ostrich. And then it says like $14,000 in one month yeah. from like, I don't know, 15 books. I think that's what it said. I don't it wasn't know. that many. Uh, uh, 15 or so. That was what I remember. That was like, oh my God, Ollie is rich living the dream Whoa. Yeah. i was still i was in i was living in vietnam at the time i think my monthly expenses were about a thousand dollars a month and i was making all this money from books and that was the first time in my life i'd had like serious disposable income yeah yeah and i i was like i don't know what to do in vietnam it's hard to spend that much money it it's so hard. hard to spend very that money. hard <laughs> very hard yeah you can't so, even find things expensive enough to spend it all so uh, how, how did you get to that level of $14,000 in a month? Cause I am pretty sure that went pretty quickly, you know, getting to that level, just from what I was, uh, I think I said, you got there in like 12 months or something. And if you got to the five, six K range in nine months, yeah. doubling must've gone quickly. Was it a, a lot of it from one book that took off or how did, how did you get to that level from five, six K a month to 14? It went from like, it went from four to eight to 11 back to six and then one book took off and got to like 40. <laughs> what was That'll different about sometimes. this book? What was different about this book? It was a very, 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 very good trend. Yeah. Mm, okay. it, it was yeah. short lived, right? That was like, a- I was super short lived, maybe like three months. Yeah. I think I know what this trend was. I'm pretty sure I know. Yeah. You probably do. No, I don't think I do know. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was, it was, um, cause that's the thing, like, and you're not supposed to say this out loud, but there is an element of luck to all of this mm-hmm. being in the right place at the right <laughs> Holy time. Shit. Oh, don't, <laughs> no, like, but no, you know, no, of course it is. I, I think it's important to acknowledge that because it's, but also I wouldn't have been able to capitalize on that if I didn't have the previous experience of publishing. So it's mm-hmm. not blind luck. Mm-hmm. It's having the ability to capitalize on a trend. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's obviously no denying that luck, no denying that luck exists, but luck is uh, you can't count on it happening. You can't. definitely don't count on luck. That's like the number one way to get no, broke. L- l- and, there's, l- and there's many people that won't uh, think- have that encounter. Or from the outside, it'll look like it, but then it's that cliche quote: "When preparation meets opportunity is when you get luck," or something like that, which yeah. is kind of true. That sounds like an Alex Kerr quote. <laughs> yeah, yeah, quoted by Alex Kerr. It's luck, like, luck yeah. is like a multiplier. Mm-hmm. yes multiplier so if like you're not doing anything and you get lucky you're still going to be doing nothing mm. yeah you still you won't get anything and i was listening to 
a podcast with Naval and he was describing like the four types of luck. It's like one is blind luck. Um, one is you being in the right place at the right time. And then another one is essentially what you just said, Erasmus, about like preparation and opportunity. Like you've got that skill set and background information and then you stumble upon something. Now all of a sudden you're getting super lucky all the time. Every month, yeah. got lucky again, got lucky again. Just keep getting lucky. Yeah, crazy. Mm-hmm. What's the fourth kind of luck? I can't remember. We'll have to edit it in in post-production, lads. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you're getting into too much detail when you're talking about the different kinds of luck. Yeah, nah, I love that stuff, man. <laughs> Naval's a G. I'm never going to never gonna doubt Naval. Yeah. So what month and year were you at, at, at this point? You know, 14, your, your, your book took off, 14K a month. And then what happens from there? Uh, where's your was, head at what are your th- I just take me through the experience that you're going through I'll be honest I was very uncomfortable because I'd never made that kind of money before yeah I was super uncomfortable but did um, you feel guilty you because of how much money you're making no I didn't feel guilty okay. uh, I just I was literally un- I was uncomfortable with just that amount of money yeah. like I'd never I didn't really know what to do mm-hmm. so I was like pretty much I spent my days panicking thinking how, how am I going to grow this money? Mm-hmm. It's like an entire day feels like it's a year long because you just have like so much time and so much opportunity. Because especially yeah. if you come from that like deprivation mindset and, you know, I was essentially paycheck to paycheck or just fighting my way up for the previous like four or five years at that point. And to finally be in a part, place where you can breathe is super unnerving. Mm-hmm. This was in March of 2018. March, 2018. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And And then after that, everything just slowly kept going down. (laughs) (laughs) Slowly kept going down. What were you doing? Were you publishing new books? What what was going on? uh, I was publishing new books, but I got distracted. You know, different opportunities, different niches. Instead Mm -hmm. of just going hard on what I had, because that would have literally been too obvious. I double down on what's working. That is always yeah, the answer. That's the biggest, like, if you've got something that's working, just go super hard on it. I made the exact same mistake myself. Start, you know, with publishing in 2017 was when I first started getting some traction, you know, and it could actually like pay some bills. And then like, I remember like making $5,000 in a month in royalties. Uh, and then, you know, I want to get it to 10K really desperately. So then I thought, Yo, if I can make 5K a month for my books and then I can start an Amazon FBA business this, that also makes $5,000 a month, put that together, that's $10,000 a month. From that's way easier than growing. So simple. Apparently. It's the most retar- Ooh, I can't say that. It's the most... Last one was, fuck you, you can say it. You can say whatever whoa. the fuck you want on our whoa, whoa. podcast. Whoa, I'm sorry. Don't you the ever most, say you can't say something. It's the most our reversible podcast- <laughs> way of thinking. Way of thinking. What did you say? Most reversible. From this perspective, though. He was going to say he, the most reversible <laughs> way, way of thinking about the problem. Come on. No, we're not giving into this stupid bullshit. <laughs> we're not. No, stop it. So uh, our director of HR is just off camera. Like I, I can feel a red <laughs> dot on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, you get stupid or just you are. Everyone is just stupid. And, oh, yeah. Uh, you, just, you don't know any better. Distracted. You don't know any better. You don't yeah, know because you you know, you buy into the whole like seven streams of income thing. And because you're yeah. dumb, you actually don't know what that means. And you think that means starting seven businesses. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Instead and of just having seven books that all make money. Exactly. Instead of just doubling down on what works, you're like, hey, let's just do some new things. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah. So, you know, so, I make I make the stupid mistakes. If I may, can we fast forward a bit? To Go! The period, uh, if you're uh, willing to talk about it just for a bit, you sold your publishing business at one point. I did. I sold my publishing business. At Close the as many details end. as you feel comfortable with. Yeah, sure. I, I sold it at the end of 2019. Um, I got a multiple of about 27x monthly profit, mm-hmm. which was you know something I was happy with. It got to the point where I had fallen out of love with publishing. Yeah. I think I, I had my heart set on doing something else. Not and yet. so I wanted cash flow. Mm-hmm. You know, so you I, got it, yeah, got got a big payday there, and then you did explore because I remember this vividly that you did explore something else outside of publishing. 
oh this is the worst thing i've ever done <laughs> yeah and right you always think grass is greener on the other side you always think that and 100%. you know maybe sometimes it is but in this case it was not most certainly um yeah i started a marketing agency wasted nine months on that um every day was miserable Mm. you you also talked about having i'm sorry interrupt no go 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 no i was just gonna say i got super depressed um because you know especially when you when you hit the highs and you're no longer reaching them and also you're waking up and doing stuff you don't want to do every day that's the number one thing that i think i can impart to people if they're tempted to do other stuff is what does your day actually look like everyone sees the end results of a business I want to start a marketing agency because I thought it'd be really easy to make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. What I didn't realize probably stupidly in hindsight was that I, what I'd done is traded in my business for a sales job. <laughs> yeah. Selling yourself. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what owning a marketing agency is. And you know, it's, it's obvious now in hindsight, but I just wasn't thinking like that. Yep. I didn't have the awareness to do it. Yep. So yeah, I wasted nine months. So that was end of 2019 and into early 2020. Yeah. So probably like mid 2019 into early 2020. Okay. Then what happened? Uh, that big cough happened. <clears throat> Do you, <clears throat> yeah. Were you in Bali when that shit went down? No, I was in, um, I was in India seeing one of our friends, Suraj. Mm. And Shout out to the Indian legend. Shout out to the Indian legend, Suraj. Um, and so I got on a plane to, I was going to go to Vietnam. And then when I landed in Vietnam, within like two days, all the flights out of the country had been canceled. Yeah. So you were stuck in Vietnam. I was stuck in Vietnam. Literally stuck. It was super weird. Like everything was closed. And like, I've been in the country like two days. I've lived there before, so it wasn't like super unnerving. But at the same time, you're in a country by yourself. Everything's closed. You don't understand what the rules are. And so I had, you know, I'm sitting there. Like I've, got, I've got this failed business. And in the back of my mind, this whole, these whole nine months is, mate, you should do that publishing thing you've been wanting to do. Mm. You should do that publishing brand you've been wanting to build. So had, had you been wanting to build the brand that you now have for a long time? Yes, without a doubt. Really? So you've always been interested in that? Oh, yeah. Like, it was always in the back of my mind, but it's it's the trade-off between, you know, sacrificing that income initially to build something. Mm-hmm. Once again, it's like, what are you gonna what are you gonna give up? What's gonna be hard? Do you want to do the hard work now and get paid on the back end, or do you want to just keep doing what's easy? Yeah, yeah. And what was the uh, what was the how does the saying go? The straw that broke the camel's back and then made you get back into publishing. Was there any certain thing that happened? I think a big part of it was when I went to India to see Suraj and to see what he had built with his Can publishing we explain business. What, what Suraj does. Absolutely. Go for it. Real quick. So Suraj is also another self-publisher who has, he's turned, you know, a small self-publishing side business into an actual company. company with like 10 full-time employees and is making, you know, really good money doing so. Um, so you went to visit him. You, you got to see his publishing operations. Yeah. I got to see it. And like every day he was in the office with his team of full-time employees, not like VAs, crazy, like actual team members who wanted to help build the business. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I saw the amount of excitement and like the amount of joy he was getting out of it. And I was like, to be honest, I just want that. Don't get me wrong, the money is amazing. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you still got to get up and do something for those 16 hours you're awake. So I figured I might as well be doing something I enjoy. Mm -hmm. So seeing, so visiting Suraj and seeing what he was doing, that was the thing that got you inspired to get back into it and do the, get into the niche that you've always wanted to go into. Uh, Absolutely. I was like, if if I can just do something I enjoy every day, Mm -hmm. I, I know the results will count because I know I've got the skills. Mm-hmm. And when did you publish your first book with your new second publishing business? June the 8th, 2020. June, June 8th, 8th, 2020. 2020. And Is that too vague? Should I be more specific? <laughs> what time? <laughs> God damn it. And since then, you've published eight books in that range? 
Uh, seven individual books, yeah. S- seven individual books. And if you don't mind sharing where that publishing business is at now. In terms of revenue? In terms of, yeah, yeah or revenue, just like where you, where you see it going or just how things are going, just an update. Like, yeah, we have a good idea, but. Yeah, so revenue-wise, we did um, over 50K last month. So okay, that I was not aware of that. I was not aware of. And I know every month, like yours, in this month is going to be even better. I'm assuming last what? month, I, last month I cheated. I sold backend products. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Publishing in terms of pure publishing revenue, it's about 25,000 a month now. Okay. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, incredibly quick. Like, I mean, what are we 10 months since you published the first book? 10 months. Yeah. <laughs> And to take it to that level with only seven books, there you go. That's what so I'd that's, say. That's that's, that's unrealistic. Unrealistic. You know what you're doing. That's and unrealistic you for a beginner. You focus on one niche. Can I finish my sentence, boy? You finish your sentence, then go ahead. I was just saying that's what you can do when you focus in on one niche. You know what you're doing, and you take a ton of action. And then what I want to say is, that's unrealistic to expect for a beginner, but for someone who has done before and has the experience can absolutely absolutely be done because and the reason why it takes a long time long time for a beginner is because it takes time to learn it takes time to have experience and understand how it all works there's no replacement for experience in that instance yeah listen like that right there i mean and you can do that again and again and again because you have the skills now yes that's why the knowledge and the education of how to do the thing in this case make money publishing books is the core foundation, most important factor in this whole thing. Not how much money you have to invest or who you know, it's what you know and how to actually pull it off. And then uh, another, another point I want to bring up from a oh, video so, I watched yesterday. Can, can, can I finish? Go. Real quick. Go. So that's why when people first get started, they naturally don't know very much. That's why they're going to fail the first few times. Mm-hmm. And we've already talked about, you know, how important that is. It's like, you know, when someone gets on a basketball court, plays basketball for the first time, they're not expecting to be as good as a guy who's played basketball for 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, learn it and then you'll get to that level. But that just shows right there, you know, you had learned it and then we can, you can get right into it. It's like riding a bike. Boom. You, explosive growth. So what yeah. I want to say is I watched a video yesterday where a guy uh, explained how he was on a podcast and he was asked uh, to the people out there listening that want to shortcut their way to success, what advice do you have for them? And his response was, um, you know, I mean, there are tactics and things you can do to, to speed up the process, but his short answer was there is, there is no shortcut. You got to get in the trenches and do the work and learn the skills. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the matter of the fact that it's what it is. And that's the case in every instance. Oh yeah. It's, it's like I had a whole list of what not to do's the second time around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's something I want to add to this or just just been here the whole time. Yeah, no, yeah. I've been here. I've been listening. Uh, So (laughs) earlier we were talking about basically how there's a huge difference between uh, doing something and then doing something well. And Ollie, there's something that you do so well to the point that, from my perspective, it's pretty close to a level of true mastery. And that is um, really being able to actually serve your customer. And you do that better than literally anyone. And for me, the way that I see it, that really is the real reason why, beyond all of the you know foundational knowledge and skill that you have, that you were able to grow this new brand so quickly. Um, and I think that's like, that's really important for people, regardless of what business they're running, you know, whether they're in publishing or whatever, that's, that's huge. Can we maybe talk about a little bit, like what that looks like in your business? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I think the biggest thing is being angry with all the other options out there and wanting to make something better. Because if you're really interested in a topic, there's certain parts of it you think are really stupid. You know, certain ways that everyone does something, you're like, why do they do it that way? It doesn't make any sense. This is dumb. And wanting to make something better or like a process that you think has to be improved. Like say, 
the, the one I always use in my niche is books always give abstract examples as opposed to using real examples. And that really annoys me. I'm like, why are we using abstract examples? Mm-hmm. Like just, just use real examples. It makes way more sense. Mm-hmm. And it's just little things like that. They all add up. And it just, it adds up in just wanting to make a better experience for the reader. And it's that I always go back to this. Um, there's this Sam Ovens video I love. Mm-hmm. And it's the one where he talks about eating your customer's complexity. Ooh. I love that video so much because it's like, okay, your customers have tons of complexity in their lives right now. The more of it you take off them and you take as your responsibility, the more you will be rewarded. And that's how I see it. Like any like process they have that I can make easier or any way that I can take something that would usually take an hour and do it for them in 10 minutes. It's that level of care and attention that really like moves the needle in your business. Mm-hmm. Cause the fact is most people won't do that because it's hard. Yep. hundred percent. So can I ask a question? Um, so uh, when we, when we talk about things like this, like, you know, serving your customers and things like that, I think sometimes because we don't explain it, it, people don't understand how that translates to making more money. So of course I know how it translates to make more money. Maybe we see it a little bit differently, but I'd like to hear from you and Alex as well, perhaps why being obsessed with the customer translates to you making more money in your business. Cause I don't just want to say it and do it or tell people to do it without, you know, the actual reason and explanation for why it works. So uh, we might have different takes on this, but I'm curious to hear yours. Let's think about what the word customer actually means. Like customer, they make it a custom to buy from you. They do it more than once. Mm-hmm. Like you don't really have a business on Amazon if you don't have a way to get people to buy multiple books of yours. You just sort of have a traffic source. Whereas if you actually look at it from a perspective of, hey, here's this one person. How can I get them to buy 10 of my books? And then another product I have. And then can I introduce them to another product that's great and they'll buy and I'll get a commission, for example. Instead of just thinking, how can I sell this book a lot? Is how can I get to this person on the other side of the screen and solve as many of their problems as I can? Because that translates as them giving you more money mm-hmm. and giving you money more often. Mm-hmm. And that's why Amazon's like one of the biggest companies on earth because I give them all my money all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So definitely. Um, I have a little bit of a, of a different take on it. So that is 100% in one way. Now, I also want to say like what serving a customer means in this case is the content of the book itself. Um, and it results in repeat customers, aka more income in that way. The way I see the strongest direct uh, correlation with how much money you make is the feedback of the public feedback of your books, aka the reviews of your books. So if you're serving your customers, you are going to be getting good feedback, good reviews, good reviews lead to more people seeing your books, more people that see it, buying your books, and then you activate the positive feedback loop. So um, that is where... Uh, like, I just want to explain to people why, why caring about your customers results in more income. Um, and those are two elements right there. Um, it's so weird, right? Because in offline business, this stuff is like r- really obvious. It's taken from, it's just, it's obvious. You don't even need to say it. But as soon as you put like a platform like Amazon in between everything, we get so hyped up on algorithms and keywords and like, like tactical stuff, we forget there's actually like a human being on the other side. Yes. And that human being is going to have an opinion about your work and they can give you feedback. They can either say, this was the worst book I've ever bought. I would have rather lit my money on fire. Or they can say, this was amazing. Like this is the best 1468 I've ever spent. Mm-hmm. So is yeah, that, that what you price all your books at? Is that what you're saying? Price my books at 1468? Is that what I that's do? That's the huh? secret. Okay. That's the big uh, secret. Everyone wink, quick, nudge, nudge. Uh, oh, remember 1338? That was the- 1338. Magic. Big up 1338. Shout out to Italians. Oh, I completely forgot about that. That, that was, was like a magic on. number. I don't know that what was the a, was. That was a game changer because yeah. we suddenly got royalties that went from $3 to 
to six dollars and we're like whoa we're rich whoa and then you go to 1638 or i like still that. see books price at 1338 on amazon amazing that's hilarious uh if, I, if I, I can just comment on the earlier topic yes no one would ever open a restaurant and expect it to just work and be profitable no matter what you serve them just you, you opened it people will just come in they're gonna we're gonna serve them frozen pizza and <laughs> yeah. shitty pea soup and it's all gonna be great and profitable uh, ima- imagine <laughs> that, that conversation it's so obvious like oh, well, no, th- then no one will come and th- they won't want to buy the thing and it'll be a, an utter failure. Well, right. same is the case when you have, you know, useless books or, R- or published is, useless books. Russ, is imagine the, the conversation between two people starting a restaurant and what they're trying to figure out is how can I deliver the product and create it as cheaply as humanly possible? Because that's what people think of publishing. They're just thinking, cheap. How do I create a book as cheap as possible? How do we serve the food to people as cheap as possible? Okay, Costco frozen, like frozen Costco foods. There we go. What, white Wonder Bread. American <laughs> shares. Grilled cheese. No butter. Too expensive. Yeah. You know? Oh, it's so funny when you... When this you, gives them something. When you correlate them with each other. Charge part. <laughs> that's funny. That, but that's basically what people are doing. But it, they're yeah. treating it like a business with people on the other side. They're treating it just as, how can I make passive income online with okay, investing okay, as little as possible? Sorry. Please Sorry. stop. Please stop doing impressions of me. <laughs> I'm very offended. Yeah, I think it can help to think of a, a publishing business like a restaurant, understanding that you got to actually serve good stuff. Yeah, and again, oh, and again, the perfect, uh, the perfect crossover here is like, how do you make more money with your restaurant? It's having the people that have come there come back all the time they come back every other week because now you have the food and they love the experience because they love the food and love the experience like that is how you get continuous customers i like okay. this analogy it's easy to understand it is, it is easy and very simple can i uh, transition into the last topic or question here please uh and it's all about ollie and you know uh my question is what are what's in the works for you right now and what's your plans for the rest of 2021 how many we have like seven months you know we're almost halfway through the year seven months left like how many books are in the works now uh where what's your business plans to uh go to the next level and what are your goals what are your goals as well baby usa okay a little um in terms of books the way I look at books now is they're purely there so I can acquire customers at a profit. This is going to be over most people's heads, but 1 million percent, but it's going to be over most people's heads. Do you want to explain it a little bit or should we not even go down that rabbit hole? No, I can explain. Basically, I get paid by Amazon to get people's emails and then I can sell them more things. Yes. And on top of that, Someone who buys a book and reads it and wants to hear more from you is the best quality, quote unquote, lead you're ever going to find. You're mm-hmm. not, you know, yeah, sure, you can run ads on Facebook or whatever, but you're not going to get the same quality of person who's already absorbed what you've given them and come into your world. So that's how I look at the business now, strictly on the Amazon side. Yeah. Uh, so we've got three or four more books planned for this year um i have a team now so i am taking a sort of back seat from the book side of things and i'm purely focused on the back end offering yeah which is a a no mate it's a video course slash coaching program type dealio yeah so i just know the comments in you know for this video for a podcast is going to be bitching about interrupting you so i'm sorry but i know you don't mind no i'm sorry <laughs> now i've said it no one's allowed i'm to interrupting say it. you now yeah no i've interrupted plain you. people now yeah how many ads do you think have been in the in the time we've been talking like 17 i'm gonna yeah, turn off the ads on the long podcast no session. no <laughs> ad revenue bruv but we want people to not get on we want people to watch the income thing. Whatever. This podcast is sponsored by Onnit. What's that crypto? 
<laughs> Alex knows what I mean. Oh, I know. They were just acquired, by the way. It's pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. So uh, just what you were referring to before about you you're getting paid to get customers from Amazon. So last month, you were saying how you did, you guys did over... Is it fair to say you guys? Are you at that level where I say you guys? No. It's still... No. No, you. No, I think it's fair to say you guys because I see it as being bigger than just me. Oh, but uh, I mean, it most definitely is. It, it most definitely is. Um, but anyway, last month, over $50,000 in revenue, 25000 of it coming from your books. Yeah. Uh, and then that's what you were saying. 50% of your mother freaking income came from just the back end product that you were offering your readers. Yeah. Like, hey, do you guys want to, you know, go deeper on this topic with me personally? And like you mentioned, through a video course coaching program, boom, doubled your income. And it's going to do a lot more. Correct than that. me if I'm wrong. The video program or video course is essentially your books in video form. Yeah, with a few, like, with more personal, like, hands on work. Yeah, yeah. but and it's not something... new, groundbreaking stuff that you've never talked about before. No. No, no, there's not a lot of quote unquote new information out there. And I think this is very illustrative for people who are interested in like selling back end products. The thing people are paying for is the personal interaction and the hand holding through the process. They're not paying necessarily for the information. Yeah. And a great example of that is people will pay $10 for a book and they'll pay $5,000 for a coaching program that includes the exact same information. This is like basically what we're saying. Um, I guess the difference is the accountability, the handholding, yeah. and, you know, in their minds, I guess the justification for paying more is um, I have a much higher likelihood of actually succeeding um, yeah. with this $5,000 program as, a, as opposed to a $10 book because most people don't take action on a $10 book and they know that. Um, yeah, and people know that in a $5,000 program that it's not the info, it's the fact that there's someone there forcing you to do it, that that's where the value lies. Mm -hmm. exactly and you know the more things you you do in a program that makes their life easier and in higher chance of guaranteeing their success the more you're allowed to charge as a business owner yes it's a simple value exchange simple value exchange uh so what are your goals for the rest of the year of course i know there are some stuff that is that you you don't want to share because you don't want your customers to know about it or so, there's some stuff but what you can talk about uh, yeah, b biggest goal is get the evergreen version of the course out. And then, you know, we're building something that is going to make the course five times as valuable this, as it is now. This is what I'm the most excited for. This thing that you're not allowed to disclose. Mm -hmm. Secret, top secret it's project. Too it's too good. Yeah. So do you, you see, when, when do you stop creating more books? And, and are books simply just lead generation for the main thing? Uh, that's a good question, actually. When do I stop creating more books? Probably when I run out of ideas. I think we'll always create books purely because I love books, like as a medium of information. I think they're wonderful. And they make a lot of money. I mean, they make a lot of money, but I just, I love creating books and I love the kind of people who you get by selling books. Yeah. Like... They're buyers. They're people who are interested in learning. Uh, yeah. They're engaged. They're, yeah. Some Just, of the best people. I love, I love working with the people in my audience. They are so much fun. And, you know, they make my life a lot easier because I'm, I'm excited when I get up every day. Amazing. So I don't think I'll ever stop creating books, but yeah. it will take less and less of a focus. That doesn't mean they'll be worse. Mm -hmm. It just means someone else will be handling that as you know i progress into the ceo role where i'm focused on bigger picture stuff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have more to say on uh on this on what your goals are you know nothing nothing big just disrupt the industry forever <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah. Like, I can't see this as being something I don't do for the next 10 years. Yeah. Like a lot of, we, we've talked about this a lot as well about, you know, 
whether you want to have like a lifestyle business or you want to create something really great. And I've had a lifestyle business and it was fun. Don't get me wrong. You know, I had a lot of fun traveling around. I had a lot of fun living on the beach, hanging out with you guys, going, going to crate every Tuesday. Shout out crate. But I'm still going to start crying. Ollie. Now I want to, I really want to build something great. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, lately I've, all I've been listening to is like podcasts with CEOs of like multi-billion dollar companies. Mm-hmm. And they're talking about the stuff they want to do and how they've achieved it. And I'm like, I want to do that as well. You know, there's a group of people that I want to do that for. Mm -hmm. Something big, big. Um, Yeah, yeah, it's going to be crazy to see everything you're going to do is technically going to be built on the back end of selling eBooks. Well, print books, just publishing books. Full credit to AIA. This thing started. Yeah, full credit to AIA. Um, I think it's in the it's in the course, right? You get fifty percent of everything. Uh, yes, yes. We're kidding, guys. Don't worry. Yeah. Ollie, um, I love you. Sexually and as a friend, I love you, Ollie. I love you like a sandwich. <laughs> Platonically. Who <laughs> did I? Thank you. <laughs> love you too. Um, yeah so um let's see what should we wrap up with i think the reason or no here lastly why i think your book sells so well you don't need to look me saying i love you me saying all legend is my way of transitioning into the end of this and you just want to keep Dude. talking about the same thing yeah we talk I about like free diving <laughs> fine <laughs> okay move on all this was fantastic thank you for sharing your story thank you guys for having me on Lots of very useful and helpful insight for people listening to this and for myself as well. I love Mate, if, pleasure. If, love you too. If you're listening to this on YouTube and you don't like all the ads that show up on this, first off, we can't control it. When it comes to like showing you ads on our videos, just shut it off. Yeah, yeah, but there's an on and off button. It's not like we can turn up how many ads people see. It's on or off. You know, so just know that it's not like we're purposely because I've just, you know, anyway, if you want to avoid the ads, go to the podcast, the podcast channel or not the podcast channel, like Apple podcasts and listen to it there. There's no ads. That's what this content really is for. But we also put it on YouTube. So go to the podcast, leave, leave an, a five star review if you feel that it is worth it. Five stars, five stars, five stars. Five. Yes. Let's not waste any more time. Thank you for listening. We'll see you guys in the next episode. Peace.